Having spoken about in the sermon this morning the existence of God and dealing with one particular strong argument, as they would call it, which it is not, for the non-existence of God, I thought once we've dealt with that, in this afternoon's sermon we would just look at the word authority. Because the existence of God, uh, without understanding the authority of God, doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, I realize authority is just one word, but think about how important a word it is. How I view that word says very much about myself and my relationship with him, and for that matter, my relationship with everybody else. In John chapter 17, or rather Matthew chapter 17, we have Matthew's inspired account of the Mount of Transfiguration. And we find uh, Peter and James and John with Jesus. And he was transfigured there with Moses and Elijah. And Peter said, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for Christ. And then we read, while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Remove authority from that, and that's the right to command and the power to command it, and that doesn't mean anything. If you come over to the end of the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28, in what we have is Matthew's account of the Great Commission of our Lord. In verse 19 and then verse 20, he says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Now, there's nothing to that at all if you don't have what's in verse 18, which reads, All power, American Standard says, All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Somebody gave it to him, and it's Jesus that had given to him, and it had to be the first person of the Godhead, the Father, in whom all authority originally resides. And he delegated that authority to Christ. And when you read in the book of Ephesians, and he talks about giving Christ to be head of the church, you'll notice that he makes him head over all things, even to the church. In other words, really he's saying if he has that authority, and he does, and he's therefore having authority over all things, of course he would be head of the church, which of course is his spiritual body. To that church he adds all those who are obedient to his gospel, which is the way you submit to his authority, because no one can get to the Father except through Jesus Christ. John chapter 14 and verse 6. So, when you come then to the early days of the church in Jerusalem, you'll read in Hebrew, or rather Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That means there's no other authority whereby men are saved from their sins. And that ties back in with the other verses we've noticed. So much in the way of religious views centers on their attitude toward authority, and much of that is simply a disdain for authority. One of the ways they do it is to give a false definition of love, agape love, which is seeking another's highest good. And the highest good I can think of for you and your, you can think of for me is to do what you can and I can for you to help you go to heaven. Can you think of a higher good you could do for yourself, your family, or anyone else other than to help them go to heaven? And you'll not do it without proper authority. And that's why you have Colossians 3.17. It's by the authority of Christ that we are to act. 
That's what it is to walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Because faith comes by hearing the Word of God. That is, the authority for us to act must be the authority of God, which is the authority of Jesus Christ. But the whole religious world tries to say, well, if you have so much love, it actually sets aside having to obey the commandments of God or submit to the authority of Christ. But I will be so bold as to say the love principle never rises higher nor sets aside nor makes null and void the authority principle. The love principle always leads one to submit to properly constituted authority. And, of course, I'm speaking of salvation when I say that. The matter of authority is real when we think of God's being. And that's why when you prove the existence of God, what have you proven? Well, you've proven here is the Creator. Here is the one who created all things. Thus, He has authority over all things. If the Lord exists, man, who is not God, is subject to Him. Of man, the Scriptures say, God Speaking, I formed him for myself. Isaiah 43, 21. That's an amazing statement. Why do I exist? You were formed by God to suit him. Now, most of us, and the devil knows this, tries to get us to think I'm here to suit me. I asked a lady one time, I said, how are you doing? She said, I do as I please. Well, of course, she was being somewhat facetious. Or at least she was covering up the reality of really what she did, but trying to be facetious. I don't know which. But the point is, that's what we all do. I'm here to please me. And the rub comes in when I'm here to please me, and so are you here to please me. But we forget if I'm here to please me, then you can have the same attitude about yourself. And that's what causes conflicts. No, we're all formed by God, and he's formed us for himself. Now, this originally was spoken of fleshly Israel, and yet, of course, it has to do with all men. But in the church, it's especially so, because we're the spiritual body of Christ, and Christ is the head. Thus, we're to carry out the will of the head, doing the will of God. In fact, uh, Ecclesiastes 12, 13 just says that's the whole duty of man. Fear God and keep His commandments. That's the whole duty of man. I think I pointed out that whole duty doesn't appear, appear in the Hebrew. It's just whole of man. And what is the whole of man? To fear God and keep His commandments. Man must deal with deity. You don't have any choice in the matter. I heard a guy saying the other day that he had actually talked to a fellow and argued with him for uh, quite some time trying to point out to him that the Bible says you're going to die. And all the record we have of everybody is that they died in the normal circumstances. This guy said, I'm not going to die. <laughs> you know, you begin to say, uh, how much can I accomplish with somebody like this? <laughs> but he actually argued that he was not going to die. I don't care how many people have died. I'm not going to die. Well, the fellow said about six weeks later, a friend of that guy came to him and said, you know the fellow you were in that argument with? said he was stabbed in a bar fight and died. And the other fellow said, well, I wonder, I wonder what his last thoughts were just for his heart quit, if he had any. Man must deal with deity. You're going to come before him someday. You don't have any choice. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and opened under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Hebrews 4.13. Now, if words have meaning, what is he saying to us? That he knows we need to understand about our relationship and our dealings with God. I want you to note the statements wherein God shows his authority over us. You remember Abraham asked 
of God and then let us know in that asking regarding the matter of Sodom and trying to see if God would uh, not destroy him. He said, shall not the God of all the earth do right? What was Abraham acknowledging there? What was he confessing? God is the judge of all the earth, Genesis 18, 25. More than that, the Bible is clear. There's no ambiguity about it. That we shall all, each one of us, all by our lonesome, will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Paul put it this way, and he's writing to the church. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. For what purpose, Paul? That everyone may receive the things done in his body. According to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5.10. Now link that back up with the study this morning on what is good and moral value and what is bad. Every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Paul wrote to the church at Rome simply saying that. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Romans 14, 12. Every thing we do, all our works, good or evil, is going to be brought into the judgment. Ecclesiastes 12, 14. Consider this. Romans 2, 16. The secrets of men, Paul tells us, will be judged. Now, I've said many times, speaking on Christian fellowship, that I may very well, no matter how hard I try to be in fellowship only with those who are living like the Lord said, may wind up dying in fellowship with people who are out of fellowship with God. There's a reason for that. I can't know the secrets of men. They can th keep things secrets, secret from you. But you don't keep any secrets from God. There are none. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, then what, what should we do? He tells us. Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. 1 Peter 1.17 and that's proper all in respect of knowing that out there in the future somewhere we will stand before God to give an account of what we did in this life, what we thought, what we said, and so forth. All of these usually, if you look at the context of these passages, are trying to say in view of that fact. What does that mean about how serious we, could we should take our life? And what we do, and the choices that we make, what we plan on doing with our lives. Every idle word, according to Matthew 12, 36. Every idle word will give account for in the day of judgment. Now the question is, can we read such verses and think about them? And from them realize that we are under authority to God. You look round about you and you see all of this stuff that's going on in America right now that says if I don't like what you're saying and I don't believe what you're saying and it's not going to the direction I want it to go, then we just silence you. You don't get a chance to say your side. You know, that, that would destroy all jurisprudence. Because the idea of a court is that when you are charged with something, you get a chance to defend yourself. You get a chance to lay out whatever it is that says, no, I am not guilty. It's the prosecutor's job to say, here's the information, here are the facts in the case that prove you are. And the defense attorney is supposed to be say, he has this, but they are not facts in the case that do that. Well, you may say, should there, there ought to be a better way. There's so much, so much in the way of injustice. You think of a better way among men. And I like to know what it is. I don't know what it would be. And yet when we think about that, God is pictured as the final judge and there's no, there's no hiding anything from him. Therefore, we must understand we should be very concerned about what we think, what we say, what we do, what we believe, and what we teach. 
as binding on others. So that sense of authority urges a proper frame of mind or proper mindset or attitude or disposition toward God and the things of God. I've had people tell me I don't care what the Bible says on that matter. You know, that just makes me have chills run up and down my spine, not because I'm afraid of it for me, but because I know they don't know what they're saying. They have no respect for God, and we're living in an age in which that's worse now than we've seen it in many, many generations. Oh, there's been times past, if you study history, you know this, there's been times past when, when people had no real respect for God. But we're coming into that now, and we've been coming into it ever since virtually World War II, but especially the 1960s. And the sad part about it is it's in the church. Some of us, my age at least, or thereabouts, can still remember the times when if you had a gospel meeting, you knew what you were going to hear. And you knew that it would fill up the auditoriums. I remember growing up at home, we never had asked a gospel meeting that we didn't put chairs in the house. We never did. You didn't think anything about it. And the other congregations round about, and Camden was a relatively small town. I think at its biggest, it's never been more than 16,000 of the county seat. And yet there were three congregations, and uh, some would come from the other smaller towns around. And the Cullendale Church Christ building, I think, would seat 250. And so even in a smaller place like that, you were going to have most nights the building full and on one or two nights when other congregations would get together and come, they ran it over. Nobody thought anything about that. I can remember standing at the back because mom and daddy sometimes would be late and there'd be so many people, you'd try to find out a place, you'd look for a place to sit. Well, that's long gone by and some of you young people have never known that. And the sad part about it is even when I remember those days, that was at the end of the time that you had lengthy protracted meetings because there were times when they had two week meetings and services in the morning services at night sometimes they would go to hold a gospel meeting at a place and there'd be so much so much in the way of responses and attendance they would continue it on for another week you can read about that all you want to from uh, I'd say 1930 back all in the 19th century. Well, what changes? Lack of the proper attitude toward God in all phases of society. Lack of a need to depend upon Him, to be pleasing to Him. Lack of a fear of God or much of anything else. Lack of a general belief in the authority of government, of a home. How much respect is there for the authority of mama and daddy? Of teachers. You know that old song that said, reading, writing, arithmetic, taught to the tune of a hickory stick? Well, you, I wonder if you even sung that in the school today, they would put you in the jailhouse. Idea of wearing some young and out with a hickory stick because it didn't act right. All things have changed. Greatly have they changed. What about your attitude concerning authorities that affects the Word of God? Do I, do I have an obligation in me, this feeling of an obligation toward it? Do I, do I have the idea that I'm bound in my thoughts, words, and actions by what it says? Or do I look upon it as serious, maybe, but not too serious? May I be reminded of his seriousness of the matter when Jesus Christ, in submission to his Father, became a man even obeying God to the death, the cruel, shameful, heinous death of the cross because of you and me and all other men, and that's the only way they could be saved. We're not to add to or to take from the Word of God, Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2. We're not to add to the Word of God lest He reprove and make us a liar, Proverbs 30 and verse 6. The word spoken will be the basis of the final judgment, John 12, 48. Jesus makes that clear. 
He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Then at the end of the Bible, book of Revelation, there's the warning, don't add to the words of this book. Don't take from the words of this book, Revelation 22, 18, and 19. It says, if you do, God shall add the plagues that are in this book to you. What about your attitude toward Christ when it comes to how you view authority, the authority of God in your life? It'll amount to the same. The Christ, as he's revealed in the Word of God, and your attitude then toward the gospel of Christ. It is a fact that the Father now speaks through the Son. That's the very point made by the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. But in these last days has spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath made heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Remember, God said, Hear ye him. John, the apostle, writing to Christians, seeking their good to keep them faithful and the proper respect toward authority and obedience to God's command, said that we dare not transgress or go onward and abide not in the doctrine of Christ. When we do, we do not have God. Then toward New Testament teaching of the Christ, while well, we have to accept all of it, we ought to study it, we ought to read everything we can to learn about Christ and his will for us. We ought to spend much time with it. And you can just go on. What about the church, its organization, its work, its worship? Where are you going to read about that? In the authoritative word of God. What about the plan of salvation? Aren't we concerned about being forgiveness of our, forgiven of our sins? And don't we want people to know about it? On the worship of the church. People treat the worship as if they can just do as they please. Well, there ought to be awe and respect of the worshipers and that awe and respect is directed properly by heeding the word of God and worshiping God in spirit and in truth you can go on and on and on where every bit of the word covers every facet of our life so in this sermon on authority it hasn't been a long one we want to emphasize that it's needful because there's no use proving God exists if you don't intend to submit to his authority He's the creator. He has the right to control us and tell us what to think and tell us what to act or how to act, what to do and what not to do. Religious division has ever been a sinful reaction to authority, always has been. Division within the kingdom of Christ has been the same. Liberalism, and I define it always to mean, unless I tell you otherwise, people teaching doctrines that loose us from what God and His doctrine binds on us, is nothing but rebellion against authority. There's only two ways you can legislate for God. And that is, come up with laws that loose us from what God and His Word binds on us, or come up with laws that bind on us that which is more strict than what God's Word is. That's all. You can just simply transgress the word, and that's sin, 1 John 3, 4. But if you teach a doctrine that's foreign to the Bible, it's either going to bind where God hasn't bound or loose where God hasn't loosed. Proper response to authority, what is it? There's only one proper response. Obeying God. Doing what he said and the way he said it, for the reason he said it, even when he said it, if all that's in the authoritative will of God. And to live obediently in all things. That means if you're not a Christian, you need to be doing all you can to learn the authority of God and submit to it in order to become a Christian. As a Christian, that's your goal. That's your life. Paul said, for me to live is Christ. He couldn't say the next part if it wasn't the first part. The next part is, and to die is gain. No one gains if they haven't got the attitude and they act, work at it for me to live as Christ. How can I live as Christ if I don't submit to the authoritative will of Christ? That's the only way you can have gain when you die. That's being faithful. 
Now, I'll close the lesson by simply saying, do you see how first principle and fundamental this is? And yet there's nothing in the world you can go through in the Bible, no matter how meaty it is, that will ever set this aside. It'll have to be the basis of everything, no matter what you're studying in the Bible. Your attitude toward God's authority through Christ in the gospel in your life makes the difference. And if your feelings and your likes and dislikes war against obeying God all the time, then you need to do something about your feelings and your attitude and likes and dislikes and set them aside to embrace the authority of God's will and submission to it. If you need to obey the gospel this afternoon, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. If you need to confess sins, having repented of them, and pray God for forgiveness, then we'll do that with you and for you. But we offer this song to encourage you to act upon what you know is right. So we do that now while we stand and while we sing it.